for joining us today. Super appreciate you coming on to talk to us about dispelling the myths around mental health and mental illness. It's such an important topic during Mental Health Awareness Month, but every day really for those of us who live in this world. Um, I know that you're an end in the silence uh, youth presenter to the high school students about what mental health looks like and how it's affected you during your journey. So if you just give us a couple of minutes and let us know um, if you could just tell us what your journey has been like so far. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be able to talk to you and tell you a little bit about my story. Um, so honestly, my mental health journey started when I was around five years old. I just didn't know it yet. And it went until, or I guess reached the surface when I was about 14. And that's when my intrusive thoughts started. And with OCD, it's definitely different than what you hear. It's definitely, sorry, it's different than what you hear. You know, growing up, it was this quirk. Just like, oh, you know, I'm so OCD today. I'm, it's just an organized thing. But I remember not being able to leave my house to go to school at 14 years old, not wanting to do things that I had previously enjoyed because I was so terrified and being sent into panic attacks over everything. I could see any object and just get these really uncomfortable thoughts in my head. Thankfully, at about 18... I was hospitalized twice, and even though that was a really difficult thing for me, it helped me get my hope back, and due to different professionals and peer support specialists, they helped me realize that these thoughts that I were, was having that was really uncomfortable, it didn't make me a bad person. These thoughts were not me, and that there was help and hope out there and not just to get to baseline because that's something that I had heard so much in my younger years of my journey of recovery is getting to this baseline getting to this point of stability but I think it's important for people to know that not only can you be stable but you can be further than that you can do great things and accomplish great things that <laughs> I feel like there's this myth that being stable is the best you can hope for. And that's just, that's like top tier, shoot for the stars, right. be stable. And there's, there's so much more than that because that's not living. And I think it's so important that yes, you have a mental illness, but you also are this whole other person you just happen to have this label, but you are this whole other person that has these great abilities and it doesn't take away from any of your intelligence. It doesn't take away from anything you're good at. And it's just really important for me because I feel like, especially in just life, once someone hears that you have a mental illness label, they, that's like all their, they become hyper fixated on that. And even though it's a part of me and it will always be a part of me and it makes me strong and I'm proud of that, that is not who I am as a whole person. It is just a piece of me. Right. It actually makes you who you are, right? It, it, it's part of who you are. And that's, you know, we all have different experiences and life references that create, mm -hmm the person that we become as we get older and have more experience and more mature, then that's, you know, that's what kind of builds our personality and our, our profile. And so it's definitely an asset to have some struggles and to be able to overcome some things and um, to have these parts of our personalities that we have to kind of manage, right? I mean, I think we could all relate yeah. to that. But so it's interesting to me that you said you first recognized in yourself around five that you were maybe having some some challenges, but it took you until you were 14 to really get to the help that you needed, um, even on any level. So can you tell me how that was for you? How was it struggling through your peer, um, you know, relationships at school and through your formative years, trying to become the person that you know you want to be? but struggle with this internal fight that you have going on. How was that for you? Yeah, so 
at five years old, I remember my mom telling the story of she took me to the doctor because I had washed my hands from my fingertips till my elbow several times a day till my skin was raw and cracking. And the doctor said it was fine. It was just a phase. And so I really went through growing up in the beginning of puberty of telling myself that even though I think and I know in my heart that something is wrong, that well, I've been told it's just a phase. And I think that's something a lot of people are told, you know, like everyone has bad days. Everyone's heard that, you know, it's just, it's just a bad day. But when you know, okay, yesterday was a bad day and the day before was a bad day and the day before was a bad day. That is not normal. And no one should be told that that is normal. Like, and if you know in yourself, and I think even at a young age, I knew like something's not right. But then you get that little doubt of, well, they said everyone has bad days. Then you're like, okay, well, maybe it's not as bad as I think, even though in your heart, you know that something's not right. Yeah, that drama queen or drama person is, when we when we talk in schools, and I'm sure you've realized this as well, you've seen this as well, but I know for me, when I'm in the school and talking to the high school students, um, almost every single one of them that has struggled with a mental health condition has been called a drama queen or they've been accused of creating drama so that they get attention or they've been accused of being an attention seeker and then eventually they just shut themselves down and they they learn not to talk about what's going on um, and we know that that's really important to recognize because the suicide rates for teenagers are increasing constantly so um so when you did finally reach out and get help, and when we're talking about OCD, I do know that exposure response exposure response therapy is very um, useful for OCD, but um, it sounds more like yours was a negative thought loop, is a negative thinking situation as well. How does the ERP, um, exposure response therapy, how does, uh, how does that work for um, the negative thought loops? Is that a, a helpful or was there something else that you had to search out for that? So even though I started my getting help at 14, it wasn't until 18 that I was diagnosed with OCD. Okay. And so going through my early journey of recovery, it, I only did CBT and DBT. Gotcha. And so I never really got the privilege of getting the exposure response therapy. I think it would have helped me because a lot of my OCD is what – my psychiatrist referred to as pure O. Yes. And it's the pure obsession, obsessive thoughts. Right. And so. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not really sure how that would have helped. Yeah. It's a difficult one for the pure O, which is the, the negative thought loops or the, the thinking loops that, um, which I think is so often missed. I think it's such a hard diagnosis to, to um, seek out because, um, you know, it's difficult to, verbalize some of those things that you're thinking but i also know that it's also difficult for uh therapists to recognize the ocd negative thought loop outside of you know well there's a lot of negative self-talk goes on anyway with anxiety and depression and just being a teenager right we we yeah. compare ourselves we talk about ourselves and it's not until you get older that you realize that um you know we all have something quirks as you put it i love the way you put that quirky it's like yeah. but this is more than being quirky and i i understand that so um so what would you say was probably the best thing that you've done to get yourself into recovery you're obviously um doing pretty well and you um are speaking out and speaking up for other people who might not recognize that this is going on in their life. Um, they might be wondering what's going on. So what, what could you give as kind of advice to somebody who was in your situation? Yeah. So the biggest hurdle I think I've surpassed is having these negative thoughts, things that are so hard to verbalize. I thought to myself, cause I knew that these aren't things I wanted to do. They were just thoughts in my head. And I would get this fear of, oh my goodness, what if I acted on it? And it wasn't until someone told me, and I think this was absolutely brilliant when they were talking about OCD, is OCD attacks the parts of you. It attacks your morals. So it's something completely different that you would never, ever do. Because if you wanted to do it, it wouldn't be the mental illness. 
And hearing that was such a relief to me because of course I knew I would never do these horrible thoughts that I had in my head, but there's always that self doubt and that fear. So once I heard that, that OCD is OCD because it's against your morals and against who you are as a person. And that's why it hurts so much. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a good way to put it. I like that, that that's a good way to think about it, to, uh, to rationalize it, not rationalize it, but, um, to, to kind of get to that understanding that, yeah, this isn't me. This is the, you know, the absolute opposite of me. And that's why this is so hard for me to manage. Um, is there any resources that you've found along the way now that you're looking back? Is there any resources that you could offer to somebody who was struggling? So peer support specialists, honestly, have helped me a lot. I talked to one when I was hospitalized one time, and I think it's it's nice to hear from a therapist or a psychiatrist or someone that they understand what you're going through, but there's only so much I believe that a textbook can teach you, and to hear someone that has literally been in your shoes that, hey, you can recover, to me, it's worth its weight in gold and means even more than a therapist or counselor saying so. So to me, that's something that means a lot and is a warm place in my heart is people that are peer support specialists. And even I found, I joined a couple groups on Facebook and just hearing people kind of along with the peer support, just talking about their struggles not in a triggering way, I think that's important, not in a triggering way, but just in a way of they're going through the same thing that I am, that that is such a comfort, just knowing, hey, they have the same thoughts that I do, like, I am a normal person, there's no normal people, but a normal person, (laughs) like, I think that is such a comfort in itself. Yeah, I I would agree, it's, um, I'm way beyond my teens, of course, but Um, I struggled a lot when I was a teenager and just knowing now the people that I know who um, in in my NAMI family who um, were struggling with the same things at the same time, I wish that we could have had that uh, support network available to us at the same time. And I think that's one of the most promising things about the End in the Silence program for high school students is that they get to see somebody who is living in recovery, who has lived what they've lived, and it makes it a little bit easier to say, hey, that's me too, and you know, I, I'm i gonna do the same thing, and I can see that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So, is there anything that you'd like to leave us with, Becky? We super appreciate you coming on and being so honest about this. Sometimes it can be really difficult to share your life with people who you're not sure if they really understand, so. Yeah, just one thing kind of going off of what you had just said was the last presentation I did, uh, it was to a freshman class and a girl came up to me and she just asked me if she could give me a hug. And I said, of course. And she said that she had OCD and she was really struggling and just told me how it meant a lot to her just to know that someone else had it. And that, it really touched me. And of course I gave her a hug, but that's, why I really believe in NAMI and the end of the silence because it just I think as much as it seemed to make her happy it made me so happy just her telling me that right there's something about being able to break that stigma down and being able to you know own that as part of who you are and I think that you know um, unfortunately when we're in the schools we do you know, a lot of the kids do end up hiding what they're going through because of peer relationships and because they don't want to be embarrassed and they're ashamed. And, and again, it's that stigma of you're a drama queen, you're just looking for attention, and they do tend to shut themselves down. And I think that if we can bring that out into the open, um, you know, and just talk about it more honestly, then more kids are going to end up getting to the help that they need in less than eight to 12 years, because everybody that I've been speaking to during these um, present, these um, interviews that I've been doing, you know, the, the average is, is staying true. It is eight to 12 years to get relief and to get therapy and to get recognized. And th- that's just too long. It's too long, you know, yeah. and we need to change that for people. So, well, thank you for coming and talking to me. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. It's really lovely to speak to you. Um, I will uh, I will talk to you soon. And I know I'm going to post the End in the Silence programs again because I know that you all are still doing those virtually. 
And so I will post the schedule up for that and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Becky. Take care. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye.